So we have four speakers here today. We have Fraser Lister. Um, he's a community ambassador for Movember. Um, had his own personal experiences with uh, mental health issues. Uh, we have James Down as well. James Downs. Um, he's a current student at Cambridge um, in Wolfson College, as well as a yoga teacher, as well as a representative from Samar I think quite a few things. So Samaritans, um, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, I believe, um, and Mind. There's probably more I'm missing, I feel. Um, and then we have Anne Feloy. Um, so she, unfortunately, tragically lost her son, um, I think, two years ago. Three, almost three years ago now. Um, and she set up a charity, Ollie's Future, um, which is basically aimed to um, raise awareness of suicide prevention. And I believe she goes on just goes throughout the country to talk about and raise the issue of suicide awareness. And there's Rory, which is also affiliated, and Ollie's friend um, with the charity. And we also have John Manning, who has set up the Arthur Ellis Foundation, which is, again, another charity to um, raise awareness for mental health issues, which I'm sure he'll um, go into depth uh, later on. So without further ado, um, I give you Fraser Lister. Good evening, everybody. Um, don't know whether I'm meant to have the mic following me around, but hopefully I'm loud enough for everyone anyway. Um, I have come here as a Movember community ambassador. Um, you wouldn't know it looking at me, the moustache and the receding hairline have done me no favours, but I'm 21. Graduated from, uh, from the other place in June, and uh, I've come into enemy territory um, because depression doesn't discriminate whether it's light, dark, blue, uh, or where you're from. And the reason that principally I'm here, and I think it's demonstrated very well just by my very poor mathematical abilities, looking around the room, there are about 14 or 15 men here at a men's mental health talk about men. It's less than half. And the issue with that is that blokes don't talk about stuff. We don't like to listen about it either. It's uncomfortable. It's going to be uncomfortable for everyone here. I'm trying to bring the mood up, but it's going to get sad. And gender is uh, the strongest and the most consistent predictor of health, not just life expectancy, but just how your health is. And on average, men die six years earlier than women globally. So if you think about the number of weekends that are getting missed out by men around the world, six years, a lot of years. It's a lot of time for men not to be living. And that's not got a great deal to do with biology. These things are largely preventable most of the time. Men are slow to act. We talk too late. And a lot of that's got to do with how we're socialized, how we're raised, what it means to be man enough. And I think that that sort of social stigma penetrates every aspect of our lives, not just our health, but it does affect our health, and that's the reason behind those six years. And uh, bringing it back to what Movember's all about, uh, you've probably seen a number of people with highly questionable facial hair swanning around Cambridge over the last month, probably all looking a little bit sorry for themselves. We get a lot of weird looks. I did cheat before, uh, before anyone else questions that. I had this for a while. And... Movember has always been holistically about men's health. It started off, uh, started off about prostate cancer, the number one cancer affecting older men, grew into testicular cancer, the number one cancer affecting younger men, and now more recently has developed into men's mental health and suicide prevention. And the reason for that is that three in four suicides are men globally, which is ridiculous. Uh, not nearly the fact that there are so many suicides, uh, it's actually one man every minute. So based on my time check, five guys have taken their own lives since I started this talk. And for every one of those, there'll have been 20 attempts. We're just, we're not very good at it. And five men every five minutes, on and on and on and on, adds up pretty quickly, especially when three and four are men. And it's a health crisis that's not talked about. It's talked about in broad terms. Everyone talks about mental health. Oh, we've all got mental health. It's okay not to be okay. Um, no one really knows how to talk about it. No one really knows what it means. A lot of people know that they've got a friend with depression, 
and don't know how that will manifest itself, don't know how to help, don't know how to talk to them, and if you're someone with it, how to talk to other people about it. And I'm losing my mic. And that's where Movember came in, growing from, uh, as all great ideas do, from uh, beers on a Sunday in Australia to the biggest global men's health movement that is now giving me the opportunity to give speaks, uh, speeches like this. Men are taught a great deal about nutrition at school, about their physical health, about their sexual health. Uh, mental health isn't something, for me at least, at an all-boys school that really cropped up. And I'd like to put a, uh, a stamp on it now and say when I'm referring to mental health, that's your mood, it's how you're feeling, it's how you're coping with the day-to-day -day stresses of life. It's not necessarily a mental illness, it's your well-being. It's how you're feeling, how you're doing. And that's an interaction between the environment you're in, the thoughts you're having, and then how that determines your self-worth. Uh, and as someone who studied at Oxford and therefore knows the academic and environmental pressures that you're under here, I'm sure it's no surprise to anyone that some of us sometimes feel a bit down. And Movember's goal is to have every man feeling healthy, um, feeling like they can take appropriate action, but most of all, feeling like they're backed and understood by their friends, their family, their community, feeling like if they wanted to speak up, something could be said and someone would listen. And I've given you a few stats about suicide, but the main thing is that for 15 to 49, for those, those age groups, um, suicide's the leading cause of death. It's not, uh, it's not getting hit by a car, it's not having cancer, it's not, uh, it's not any of those things, it's taking your own life, it's, it's weighing up your achievements, your life, everyone who loves and cares about you, weighing it against your problems and forfeiting the former. And we're only going to deal with that if we start talking about it. 70% of guys say that their friends could rely on them if they had an issue. We all like to think that we could bear the weight of the world on our shoulders, I certainly have but only 48% of men actually think that they could turn to a mate if they needed help. And that discrepancy is something we need to sort out. So a lot of talk about mental health and men's health is focused on getting guys to speak up. What I'd also like to try and advise you on is how to listen, how to help other people. And uh, we do that by an acronym that was given to us by uh, Are You OK? It's called ALEC. So you ask, ask open questions. Don't ask closed questions. Ask open questions that give someone the opportunity to speak and then listen to them. Take the time. Saying, oh yeah, we'll have a catch up at some point, ain't good enough. It's saying, you know what, we're going to look in this time and I'm going to sit down and listen to what you've got to say. Explore their options with them. Now, as blokes, we are always very keen to come up with an answer straight away. You're feeling sad? All right, I know what to do about that. Nobody knows what to do about it. Okay, so explore their options. Explore their options, talk to them about where they can access help, whether that's professional or not. And then check in, which is my most personally important one. Checking in with a bloke in your life, whether it's your, your dad, your brother, your uncle, your granddad, a mate, your boyfriend. Check in recurringly, see how they're doing. Because those small conversations and those check-ins, when someone doesn't have the power to reach out to you, are the moments you're going to save someone's life. And the reason I can say that with conviction is because of my story, which uh, I get touted about by November to talk about, um, but that's all right. And, uh, and it begins when I was 16. Um, I was at an all-boys school and uh, had all of the trimmings that come with that, you know, banter with the lads, group chats that I didn't feel really like a part of, and um, rugby that I was on the cusp of being good at. Let's go with that. And uh, two weeks before my GCSEs, um, come home, normal school day, and my mum's cooking up dinner. My dad's just got home from work. He's, uh, he's decided that he's going to go on a run. He was uh, getting fit to run the London 10K, raise money for the Evelina Children's Hospital. He goes out on a run. About 15 minutes later, we get a knock on the door. And this man goes, I've found a man uh, passed out in the road outside. We, uh, I don't, my mobile's dead. We need, to, we need to call an ambulance. And I was first aid trained. I was an army cadet. And mum shouts up. She goes, Fraser, go and check out, see what's going on. So I sort of stick my trainers on, walk out into the road, look up the, look up the lane. And uh, lo and behold, about 100 feet up the road is my dad sprawled out on the ground. And, uh, and I, went into, I went into kind of mission mode. There was no feeling there. It was right, this is a patient. I've got to 
help this person. And, uh, and I'm racking my brains. I've run up to him and I'm going, right, Dr. ABC, Dr. ABC, right, is there any danger? Um, can I get a response? I'm tapping him on the shoulders going, Dad, can you hear me? Open your eyes if you can hear me. Nothing. Check if he's breathing. Put cheek to the face. Nothing going on. Tilt the head back. Check his airways. Nothing going on. Start giving him CPR. And I gave my dad CPR for best part of 15 minutes until the ambulance arrived. They went for another 45 and we lost him. He wasn't ill. Uh, not that we knew of anyway. And there's nothing to prepare you for that. And that was two weeks before my GCSEs. And I was used to being a high achiever at school because my dad had always been so in my corner over it. Neither of my parents went to uni. Um, my dad was battered all over the place in his childhood, was abandoned uh, at points. My mum was from Essex. Less said about that, the better. And they both wanted me to do well. So that's what I did. I went, right, okay, funerals in a week. I've got to crack on. I remember standing there in the road while the paramedics are going on and I looked in a pothole and there was a reflection of myself and I looked down there and I went, how on earth are you going to financially provide for this family? I'm an only child. My mum's a marriage registrar. Earns about two and a half grand a year. I was like, right, this is on you now. Two weeks later, sat my GCSEs. Didn't want to take any time out. Wasn't having that. It's not what dad would have wanted. He was always champion in my academics. He was always peering over my shoulder when I didn't want him to telling me where the maths was wrong when I didn't want him to. Um, I regret all of those times that I told him to sell off, but what can you do? And uh, I sat my GCSEs, I got straight A stars, and everyone thought I was great. It's like, God, he smashed it. Where's this come from? And, uh, and I wasn't all right, but, you know, we, we go on. Sixth form comes about, achievements keep coming in thick and fast. I was a uh, regimental sergeant major of the cadets. I was a deputy, uh, no, what was I? It's head of the school council. Yeah, that old chestnut. That's a job. And I got my A-levels and I got a place at Oxford and I went off to uni and I was flying high, but I wasn't. And I got to uni and all of the trimmings that come with that, all of the rugby and the boozing and the fun and the wanting to be the best bloke and wanting to reset that button, you know? You've had a tough time at school. This is the time where I live my life. And I drove myself into a hole. I was out two, three times a week. I was boozing harder than anybody else was, not least because I thought it made me look impressive, but also because it helped. Um, I lost friends. I upset a lot of people. And I upset myself. And my self-esteem was at rock bottom. And it was about halfway through my first year that I walked out of the lecture and went, I'm not much for this world. Um, I'm a terrible bloke. There's no reason for me to be here anymore. And I walked home from that lecture, saw off half a bottle of whiskey and tried to hang myself. And I didn't tell my mum. I didn't tell my GP. A couple of friends came over because I called them. Not the friends I'd normally call on either, but they were the only people who knew me well enough because I was only six months in. And, uh, and this happened and we kind of, we went through the motions and it happened again a few months later. Uh, had a binge, took all the pills I had in my possession. And that was the time I called my mum and I, I sat down with my mum and I said, right, you know, uh, this has happened. And it was the hardest conversation I've ever had in my life. And no one should have to have that conversation with their mum. No one should have let it get to that point. Twice. I tried twice. Terrible at suicide, as I was told by a, by a friend at the rugby club. Um, in good health. And I started working on it from there. And it was about that time that November rolled around and I got involved with Movember. Started fundraising. Started doing this sort of thing. Um, However tough the story is, I don't find it very difficult to stand up in front of people and talk. You'd do well to shut me up half the time. So I'm happy to come out and do this. And uh, how am I doing for time, by the way? Am I good? All right, good. Uh, and I, first year at Oxford, we raised about 12 grand. Second year, we raised about 24. And uh, I did a bit of campaigning here and there and graduated, scraped my 2-1 and got myself a job in the city and I've moved to Brixton and it's tough. It doesn't necessarily just get better like I thought it would when I went to uni. Uh, you've got to put the hours in. It gets easier every day, but you've got to try and you've got to take the time. Um, I took a half day off work today to go and get my GP sorted. That wasn't something I would have done if work hadn't made me. And I think the key message with my story is that I just didn't want to tell anyone because I thought I was a burden on them. I didn't want to be the reason that anyone was worried. And I lost friends because of that. 
um, the ones I did tell, because it's a lot. It's a lot to be there supporting someone who's dealing with that level of depression. And that's why I do what I do with Movember now, to try and not only equip people with the ability to talk, but chiefly to equip people with the ability to listen and how to support people properly. So diving out of that and into kind of some more hard line bits of advice is how to keep an eye out for a guy. Um, and I only saw this slide in a, in a presentation that was given by Movember a few weeks ago, but it really resonated. Um, doing less of what he enjoys. If your mate isn't turning up to practice or he's not, uh, he's an artist and he's not doing much, or maybe he's a bit of an influencer and he's not posting. It can be literally anything. If he's not doing what he enjoys, there's probably something wrong. Sounds really obvious, but as a bloke, you normally wouldn't really notice it in your mate. Oh, he's, he's, you know, he's probably busy doing something else. That's why he's not here. Um, I did less of what I enjoyed when I was at uni. The number of training sessions I skipped because I was feeling terrible, the number of matches I didn't want to play in. Um, and that was only third team rugby. And stuff like that or just not showing up at all showing up late skipping lectures i loved skipping lectures um but i did do human sciences so you know that was kind of acceptable and skipping lectures or showing up late to things that are important to you if you know that it's really important to him whatever it is and he's showing up late that's not because he's lazy it's because something's wrong a lot of the time taking less care of himself ironic with movember because we look like this but if you can tell he's let himself go a bit or he's uh, experimenting with a new beard, or he's clearly not ironed his shirts in the last week, or something, it can be anything, really. You know your mates better than I do. Have a chat. Check in. Self-destructive behaviour. Oh, I was the king of that. Um, if he's boozing too hard on a night out and not because he thinks it's fun, if he's locking himself away, or diving into things you wouldn't normally do. We've got a lot, of, I know a lot of people, myself included, who oh, I'm not a smoker, but oh, if there's a, there's a night out, we've had a few pints, yeah, go on then. No, no, if, if you know that that's not normal for your mate, then there's probably something up. Um, and getting angry more often. The number of fights that I've lost with brick walls over the last three years, I tell you, you can't win. Um, three brick walls and a window. I beat the window. I'm not an angry person. I'm not really an aggressive person. Um... But you can just be irritable. It's the way that it works. I could dive into the neuroscience, but that was the one part of my degree that I got to two in, so I'm not going to. Um, but you will. You'll be more irritable. You get angry more often. And those are the times when it's tempting as a mate to be like, oh, he's being an ass. I'm going to turn away from that. You know, if he doesn't want my help, if he's going to get uppity with me every time I try and check in, uh, then serves him right. Normally that's because they need help more than ever. So those are the five things about keeping an eye out. And then there's just how to be a good mate, uh, which is pretty simple, really. Text, call, check in. Lock-in time. I said earlier, let's catch up soon, doesn't cut the mustard. Lock-in the time. If you know that someone's probably going through something, just lock in a bit of time, have a coffee. Um, activity. A lot of people who fundraise for Movember don't do it by growing a tash. They do it by moving for Movember. And we all know that being active helps your mental health. It's sort of a, it's drummed into us every day. And uh, shoulder to shoulder is often how these issues get fixed. For me, that was rugby, literally shoulder to shoulder, sometimes shoulder to bum in a scrum. But those are the dragging your mate out and taking him on a walk or going to the gym or just doing something. Maybe, you know, he likes art and you want to go do an art class. That's the sort of thing that can help. Listening. Listening is hard. I suck at listening. I love the sound of my own voice. And I always think I've got the right answer. Movember is gradually teaching me that I have none of those answers. Um, so listen and explore the options with them and just share your positives as well it's all doom and gloom or it might sound like it with this sort of a talk but quite often and something I get reminded of frequently at work is that I might have had a really good week on paper you know I've, I've smashed out some some deliverables or I've I've achieved something I've impressed someone but if I've done one thing wrong last week being case in point um, stupidest thing I made uh, a slightly immature joke in the office regarding a Harry Potter passage where they replaced the word wand with something else. And I got called out on it and I felt like cack. I really, really was kicking myself. I was like, oh, I just thought it was funny. But everyone here is over 30 and it's not funny. And that totally negated everything good I'd done that week. 
for me. And it took my housemate to pull me to one side and be, stop being an idiot, write down the things that you've done well, and think about those for a change, because that will motivate you to do better. And share your positives with people and help them to share theirs. If you're being positive about it, they're probably going to come out and go, oh, well, you know what, I did, uh, I did throw quite a good pass in that training session. Or, yeah, I did do all right in that essay. Um, if you're not doing all right in your essays, I totally sympathize. And um, kind of brings me to the, to the last point. If your mate is trying to listen, uh, a wise man told me, uh, you've got to look after number one. Number one's you. You can't help someone with an issue unless you're in a good place yourself. Not necessarily the best place, not necessarily you're on top of the world, but a solid place, a place where you are ready to help, where you're ready to listen. Because the worst thing, and I'm sure we can all sympathize with this, is reaching out to someone and them saying, yeah, yeah, I'm here for you. You just never hear from them. It's gutting. It's absolutely gutting. And uh, I've had that a number of times. Um, Frankly, it was better when I had someone turn around to me face to face and say, you know what, I can't do this. This is too hard. I'm sorry. Um, it hurt, but it was better. So if you're going to offer your help to someone, make sure you're in the right place for it. And the way to do that is to follow all of the steps that you would use to help them. I watched, uh, watched an interesting video the other day by Ant Middleton, uh, the bloke from SAS uh, TV program. And he said, um, you can't ever lead other people unless you're self-led unless you got yourself on lockdown. And that resonated with me because I love to lead, um, but I really don't have my shit together. And making sure I do before I start is important. So if I can give you any takeaways from this, um, check in with your mates, ask them how they're doing, listen to what they've got to say, explore their options. If you're going through a tough time and you don't know who to ask and you're here right now, grab me at the end We'll go to the bar. I don't drink uh, anymore because I've realised that that messes me about a bit. But I'll stand another juicy tonic. It's only been two weeks. I'm struggling. Um, and look after number one. Make sure that if you're, you want to help somebody out and you want them to reach out to you, make sure you're in that position to do that because it won't help either of you. You've got to, got to be ready. And the last plead I would give, um, and I'm actually... I mean, slightly self, uh, self-inflated here, but Cambridge doesn't have a Movember ambassador, to my knowledge. I joined as a student ambassador when I was at Oxford, uh, and I'd wanted to make it a competition because everything's bloody competition uh, between us two. If you're sitting here and you're like, I could do that, or you're thinking I've got a mate who could do that, let me know. We'll get them links up because it's not about the money is what I've realised. Fundraising's great. Um, fundraising funds, very important things, but the important things have been where I've had a girl come up to me in a club, um, happens rarely, and uh, they've gone, my boyfriend read your article in the Churwell and uh, he's started seeing counsellor. Or I left an article out with the Telegraph recently, basically saying what I've just said to you, and uh, the number of messages I got of people I've never met before on Twitter or Instagram saying, I've been through something similar, I have no idea who to talk to. And I'm like, well, you know, um, I'm not your best mate, but I'll listen. Uh, you could spread this message. You could spread this conversation. You could start getting people to talk. And gradually, day by day, things will get better. Um, but bringing it full circle back to the first point, less than half the people here are men. And that's where Movember sometimes falls on its heels a little bit, uh, is that everyone assumes it's a charity for men. It's not. Uh, we have Mo Sisters, you're called. Catch you that. And behind every horrendous moustache is a woman saying, please shave that off. Hopefully that woman is also saying, talk to me about your problems or talk to your mates. So if you're watching this thinking, I've got a mate uh, who could probably do with someone to talk to, just, get, just muck in and do the best you can because... We can't do much more than ask, listen, encourage action and check in with people. We're not all trained professionals. But if we all did that every day, I think that male mental health would be in a much better position than it is now. And uh, I think we'd all be much happier blokes. So thank you for your time. And if you are thinking, I know at the end we've got questions, I for one wouldn't, well, actually I would put my hand up and ask a question in a crowd. I'm like that. But if you are thinking, I've got something I want to say, but I don't want to say it, grab me. Um, I've got time. I've only got work in the morning. Uh, it's 
very important, apparently. But yeah, um, I'll stick around and yeah, look out for the guys in your life because we're rubbish at doing it for ourselves. So uh, yeah, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you, Fraser, for that uh, really inspiring talk. Um, next, we have James Downs, um, which will hopefully have another unique perspective on the issue. I'm definitely not that tall. Let's see how it goes. <laughs> I'm really excited to speak here, partly because um, it's my own university, just finishing my master's in psychology and education. Um, part-time, I would say very, very part-time, alongside other things like teaching yoga. Some people here might have been to my classes. Some people organizing might have been to my classes. And if everything goes wrong, we can just do a mindfulness exercise. It'll be great. I've already had my picture taken on the sofa doing a yoga posture. And we had to sign a book, which apparently Gandhi signed. So it was a lot more um, official and formal than I thought, but it's very exciting. <laughs> Um, a bit of background about me, so, so there's my studies, I'm kind of waiting for the results on them, and I'm officially a student till sort of mid-December, so ma making the most of the student card. But um, I, I teach yoga and I work for various charities, Samaritans, who sort of made this t-shirt, which says, sometimes it's alright not to be alright, and um, MIND, and I do work with the NHS writing policies around eating disorders and nice guidelines and that kind of thing. So. I'll talk a little bit more about my experience, which I'll just emphasize is only my experience. And just listening to Fraser, I mean, like, men are very, very diverse, right? Even though we're two sort of young white men, our experiences sound really different. And um, bearing that in mind, you know, I'll try and draw out some points that could be relevant to male mental health in general. I'm not saying that, you know, what I've been through is the same for everybody, but this, there could be some useful points for us all. But it's quite a tough ask, really, um, thinking about like what is it that's uniquely um, difficult about my experience because I'm a man, and would that be the same if I was female? You know, isolating that, I think that would take some really difficult like qualitative research and statistics to work that out. But um, you know, what is it that's uniquely male about my experience of mental health and eating disorders, and what's made that more difficult from being male? And kind of have to face it that you know. Being male has loads of perks, like, and sort of systemic perks to being male and white and young. And, you know, I think it doesn't mean, therefore, that there aren't some challenges in some areas. And just to sort of disclose at the beginning, my experiences that I'll be talking about are mostly to do with eating disorders. I'm 30 now, and I've had a diagnosed eating disorder since I was 15, both anorexia and bulimia and OCD as well, and that's sort of been rooted in experiences of complex trauma since a young age. And also, one last sort of um, caveat, it's not about positioning men against women, and I kind of get this, especially on Twitter, you start saying, men get eating disorders too, and then it becomes a sort of oppositional thing of like, oh, but, but um, women do, men do, and it's not saying that sort of our, our needs are greater than anyone else's. You know, I think you can advocate the needs of everybody without pitching it one against the other. So I don't want it to sort of get into that kind of space. Um, when I look back at my, the development of my issues, I mean, I think there were roots that went much further back than when I was actually diagnosed, which was first with OCD. I think that it all came out of context, but it was also the context um, in terms of the responses that I got to... Um, my difficulties. So I don't think it was just that I had these endogenous problems that came out um, of nowhere. The, there was very much sort of underlying factors at home um, and then also exacerbated by sort of not feeling heard when I did go and try and get help. So if I think about school, I really struggled with body dysmorphia and symptoms of OCD around body image first before I started controlling food. And I was so anxious about leaving the house um, and took maybe six hours sometimes to leave the house if I left the house at all. And then I would go to school and often not be able to make it into the school. And the way that my school responded was as though I was being badly behaved. And they, I went to a really terrible school in, in South Wales. And I think they weren't, they weren't especially um, high achieving or anything. And they thought that I was being really arrogant, that I felt I didn't need to go to school because I was doing well anyway. And um, they didn't see the hours of sort of compulsive rituals behind having to get to school in the first place. And 
I felt like I was being treated as though I was badly behaved rather than having a mental health problem. And then when I did get a diagnosis, I had to educate them about, you know, this is, this is what it is and this is the kind of thing that I might need to support me. And it didn't work out well. And I ended up having to leave the school about 15, 16. So sort of did my A-levels at home or whatever. But um, I think that's maybe a place where if I was not male, I might not have been treated as though I was just, just badly behaved and true. And I don't really know. But also then when I went into mental health services, you know, I missed nearly a whole year of school before anyone found out because, like Fraser was saying, I just didn't tell anybody. I didn't even know that there was a problem, actually. And I became very, very isolated. I would walk around the city and then go home at the end of the day and say, yeah, school was fine. Um, but when the parents' evening happened and they were like, where has he been for a year? I had to go to the doctor and I realised there was something really wrong. And I started being seen in mental health services. Um, and... Again, it was sort of like, this is a behavior problem that you have to fix, and then you can go away. And also, you're clever, so you'll get it fast, and you can go away. And I felt like that was not really addressing the distress that was underpinning that. You know, there was a reason why I was really fixated on rituals and obsessive-compulsive behaviors. And that part wasn't addressed. It was just, we need to fix you and send you away. And slowly it changed onto sort of weight and shape, and I started to have a very visible manifestation of, of a problem that people could clearly see that I was ill. I mean, they thought that I had cancer, but actually I had anorexia. And there was a big sort of issue in the mental health services themselves that they didn't know what to do about a young boy with anorexia. I think they openly admitted that they hadn't got many cases like that. Yes, maybe it was becoming more common, but that they didn't really know what to do. And, you know, you better get better before you're an adult, because it's even worse when you're an adult. There's no help. And scaring someone into getting better doesn't really work, I don't think. There has to be a positive reason to want to recover. But there was a sort of endless sort of pursuit of different diagnoses. So I was sent from one specialist to another and they all had different opinions. None of them would say that there was a primary eating disorder, even though I was sort of wasting away and in and out of hospital all the time. It was, oh, you must, you must have um, be on the autistic spectrum. You, it must be bipolar. It must be something else because it can't simply be um, a male with anorexia. And I think that in the end, that that was just another way for me not to feel like I was being seen and heard. And it just perpetuated throughout my life. I mean, there's lots and lots of um, ins and outs to it because it's a quite a long journey. And when you're 30, you still find Harry Potter jokes funny, even <laughs> whatever it's about. But um, I've been in and out of services and many, many things that I've not been able to do that I've wanted to do, including like coming to Cambridge when I was 18, when I had a place, but I couldn't, I couldn't ever come. And now it's sort of worked its way around that I have come part-time for a master's. But in adult eating disorder services later on, when I had to drop out of university um, around 22. Again, I, I finally got to see specialist eating disorder services. And this was like six years after I first was diagnosed. Before then, I couldn't see the adult services because they said I was too underweight. And so I had to get better on my own because if you were so underweight, you couldn't engage with treatment. That has changed because the evidence has changed about that. But I sort of thought, well, if I can do that bit myself, then I don't really need the treatment in the first place. But, um, and then later on, I've been, more recently, I've been too overweight to access help, um, to, you know, not underweight enough. But that's, that's another issue. But when I did get into adult eating disorder services, it was very feminized, the experience, you know, the, the service was very feminized, the setting was very feminized. Lots of butterflies on the wall saying, you know, you don't need to have a bikini body. And I was like, well, I, I never wanted to, well, maybe I did want to wear one <laughs> but well, that's another story. But like, I think like, I think I would look fine in a bikini. But the, the issue was that it, like, I didn't feel represented. You know, I was given a book which said, the person with anorexia, she will do this. Or the, the person with bulimia, she will, she will lose her period. And I was given an information book saying, you might have lost your period. What will happen when you gain the weight? And you know, like, I could make a really bad joke about that as well, but I'm not going to. But um, uh, the thing is that I just felt like that it was a very feminized service and all the staff were female and all the other patients that I saw were female. And I, I thought sort of like, well, where is the space for me here and who is like me um, out there and who has had this similar experience? And the big hallmark of my whole experience of mental health, actually, and a big thing that I think is 
is really important to address is, is the feeling of isolation and loneliness and alienation. You know, I think I grew up feeling profoundly alienated and different and unable to connect with other people. And I think that, that only these experiences with services only reinforce that at some points. And there are other things that um, sort of informed that as well. But I do think that it would have helped to have been able to talk about what it, would, what it is like to be male with an eating disorder. I didn't get information about sexual function for men when you have anorexia, but that completely stops. And then again, there were other sort of things imposed on me of explanations to do with sexuality that, you know, as a gay man, it must be that I haven't come to terms with homosexuality, that I have an eating disorder. And it's a nice, neat, simplistic narrative but nobody asked me if that was the issue it was just put on me and I don't have a, a background which means that homosexuality is an issue and I never felt that it was really an issue for me but I do have I have had issues with having a sexuality at all with having a libido with having like puberty at the age of eight and I was this tall with a, with a deep voice when I was 11 you know um, I think that there wasn't space to talk about about that and learning to regulate energy, especially when you recover from being very, very underweight, getting used to feeling heat in your body, getting used to feeling a libido coming back, and like, what do you do with that energy? Same with like, intellectual energy. I was in a school where I felt I was completely unstimulated for so many years. Like, how do you regulate that? And I've become somebody who's like very all or nothing, and I still have bulimia now, and you know, that's, you know, you don't know how to regulate the intake. It's everything or nothing, and I think that, you know, with the sexuality point, it's, it's kind of not subtle enough just to say, oh, it's because you're gay and you'll grow out of it. It's kind of a get out card, isn't it? It's like, you know, we don't need to really give you therapy about that. Um, certainly not like conversion therapy or anything, but it's, it's kind of another way just to not see the person. And we have to see people as um, nuanced and subtle and mental health professionals have to do that and that includes GPs who are also mental health professionals even though they don't always know it and I think that you know we have a background of very little evidence in terms of what works in eating disorders what works in mental health compared to other um, comparable like similarly common um, physical health issues but does that, I don't know if that really matters, really, when the main source of evidence is not the papers, it's the person in front of you, you know? And, and I felt that I wanted to be treated as, as an individual, and that never really, really happened until much later on. Um, so in terms of my experiences and how, that can, how I can say something useful about that for other people, I think that we know, and I'm really grateful for all the stats, that sort of 75% of suicides are male. And, you know, again, it's not like a competition or anything. You know, more females attempt suicide than men. Um, men are more successful at completing suicide. Um, and we know that men find it, there's research that says men find it difficult to talk about their issues. But... I think that, I don't know, maybe that's related to more extreme ways of coping and that you end up storing it up and then you, have, you only have sort of more extreme ways to cope in the end. But I do think that we have to be careful with some of the narrative around men talking because I think it's a bit lazy to just always, every time the subject comes up and I get asked to do lots of media interviews for, for various charities, it's the same line of, well, well men don't talk about their feelings. Well, men don't talk, men don't speak out. And I think that somewhere along the line, it just becomes men can't speak out. And I think that sort of, I don't, I don't like to feel that that's being reinforced because men can speak out and men don't talk about their feelings as much perhaps because it's not inherent to them, it's because the contexts aren't there and there aren't the settings for men to talk where they feel comfortable and there aren't necessarily the people who will give the responses that they need or want. And yeah, I'm wearing this t-shirt that says sometimes it's all right not to be all right, but it's not always all right, you know? And it's all right not to be all right <laughs> if you have the support there and if you have somebody that you can connect with with that. It's not all right to not be all right if you're on your own and you have to hold that completely on your own and you feel that you can't. And you know, more recently, I had, a, had an experience in the summer which really drove it home to me that the responses that you can get to your emotional distress can make it so much worse. I was in college and I'd had really deteriorating mental health over the end of the year and 
in a crisis situation, and I called the emergency number that we have here, the 111 number, and they couldn't understand me because I was so upset, and like I was crying so much that they couldn't understand me. And so they hung up on me, and they said, like, if, if you can't say your name, we can't help you. And like they didn't help me to calm down or anything, and I was absolutely distraught. Like, when you say, like, I'm in pain, and nobody hears that, it's... Like you just feel unreal. You feel like, well, it's not worth being heard, or it's invalid. And you know, we used to call people invalids, didn't we, for a reason, probably. But it's, you know, I then went to the porters in my college who did not have a clue what to do. I was just sort of left on my own in the in the entrance to the college, which was really humiliating, on the floor in the fetal position, having a panic attack. And then because they didn't have training in mental health first aid, which all colleges staff should have. And then called an ambulance, and they they said, oh, "Well, you can you can say your name and address. We can't come out to you." And they and then they, they hung up because I was like, "What the fuck?" Well, you know, like, and and in the end, you know, I sort of did manage to calm down in the end. But I, at that point, I had the means to end my life laid out, and I was saying, "I'm going. I feel like I'm going to do this." And I thought, no wonder people end up taking their lives. You know, like. If in that situation where I was able to, what about the people who can't reach out? You know, it's it's just so despairing, and I think that if services can't catch people, then it's almost you know even more important that we can, as groups of people who support each other, and you know that sort of isolation. It's it's a really key point to me, and I think that you know, we have to let men know that it's okay to talk and the way that we do that is through the responses that we give, you know. I think it's a privilege to have good mental health, I find that. I wake up with good mental health and I'm like, oh my goodness, I need to share this, I need to really make notice it because tomorrow it could be gone and, you know, today wasn't a, wasn't a good day for me at all and I think that it's, it's fine to have mental health campaigns saying men talk, you know, or, or people should talk about their problems, call a friend or whatever. But it does depend who you talk to. It does depend if that friend says, call me any time, or whether they actually reach out to you and help you to talk and encourage you to make the steps rather than, you know, if I wanted a helpline, I would call the Samaritans. They're great. Um, and... I can't always present the full formulation of what's going on for me and come out with exactly the thing that I need to say often I don't even know what I need to say. And so being able, when you do have good mental health and recognising that's a privilege and sharing a little bit of that with other people who might be struggling and checking in with them in a way that's not tokenistic, I think that's something that we can all do when we feel like we're able to do it in a way that's not really, really passive. Because I think that in the end, people and there's something that I often say, I think people don't always want to be helped. I think people, most of all, first of all, want to be heard. And I've been in services where, or, you know, overbearing parents, where they're like, you have a problem and suddenly you've got to fix it, you're going to throw all the solutions at it. And there's a preliminary stage where you have to be sat with and heard and it's okay not to talk and maybe you need a bit of distraction. But in, in the end, there has to be some kind of emotional engagement with your experience that tells you that it's real, and then it is all right not to be all right. But for a lot of men now, it's really not. And I think that it does start with people having these conversations. It does start with people sort of checking their privilege and, and sharing some of that. And I think, hopefully, if you can go away and, and um, share a bit of that as well, then that, that would be really, really helpful. But remembering that people don't always need to be helped. You don't have to be a mental health professional in order to really hear somebody who may or may not be suffering. Thank you. I just wanted to say I bookmarked it with my election card because mental health is very political. <laughs> Thank you very much, James. That was really insightful. Um, the next speaker, we have two speakers, actually. So we have Anne and Rory. I don't know if that's a bit high for that. I'm not sure. No, I can move it away. That might be okay. That's a bit better. That's better. Thank you. Well, thanks ever so much for inviting me here today. Um, it's a, a strange um, set of circumstances, really, that I find myself here. But first of all, I'm 
Anne Folloy, and I'm the founder of Ollie's Future. When I say it's strange, it just feels like my son Oliver, who very, very sadly took his own life, um, is with us here tonight. Uh, he feel, he's always with us, and he's always with me and the young people that I work with now, um, and you'll hear from Rory. But uh, I, we got an invitation to come and speak here, and I was thinking, gosh, this is unusual. Um, wonder how this has come about. And of course, Dan had met my son. Uh, and this is what I feel is so remarkable um, with, with the work we do. And uh, it's Ollie's Future. It's the charity we now have in memory of my son. And I've, you've probably got a, a, a photograph there of him um, on your seat. And there's also some information as well about uh, suicide prevention, because that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, but I basically find myself um, meeting amazing people like Fraser and James, just listening to them now. So much resonates, and it feels like um, Oliver would, should be here talking as well, because so much is happening now with young people with mental health, um, and in particular men, mental health, that um, his story uh, resonates tonight. So I am going to tell you a little bit about what happened, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about our organisation too. But first and foremost, I am Ollie's mum. I used to call him Oliver. Typical, typical mum thing. I called him Oliver, but everybody else knew him as Ollie. And um, he was very, very bright, very, had huge amount of empathy as a small child, uh, incredible amount of empathy, very caring, very compassionate. And so, you know, remarkably mature for his age. And I think um, that's possibly part of the story because Oliver was immensely uh, popular, very, uh, very successful, if you like, in his studies. Uh, he got a first from UCL, and that was just six months before he died, before he took his own life. So you think to yourself, how, how on earth could someone who traveled around the world in his gap year, sang jazz, uh, performed at the Adelphi, had uh, gorgeous friends, girlfriends, so many um, wonderful opportunities in his life, a family, my husband's here, um, you know, uh, another brother who is, uh, they were so close, how, how does this happen? How is it that I'm now standing here uh, as a, a bereaved mum and my son should be here, you know, speaking for himself? But what happened in our case was that um, he had been uh, that that product, if you like, of success, and and I see that in in you here tonight. Um, you're here at Cambridge University. You've been very successful to get here. So that momentum to do well, that pressure of success, um, must have take, carried you a long way. And that drive, um, which I saw in Oliver, which took him forward so quickly and so successfully, went into reverse very very quickly. So within five weeks, we, we feel that in, a, in about the space of five weeks, um, the whole story turned. And of course, uh, here was someone that had never um, spoken about mental health issues before. Um, Rory knew him since he was 11. Uh, none of us were aware that there was any depression or, or anxiety. And yet he found himself quite isolated in Shanghai, where he's working for the British Council. And uh, quickly things unraveled, and that can happen. So I think the message really um, is that suicide um, does not discriminate. You know, it, it can affect anyone. It doesn't actually have to be someone who has lots of um, uh, depression or anxiety in their life. It, it can actually um, affect, well, it does affect all people. It's true that um, more men, three times as many as women, take their own lives. And it's also true that um, two-thirds 
of all suicides are not known to the medical professions. So, and that, again, was Oliver's case. In fact, what happened with him, um, he was back from China, uh, wasn't happy over there. We knew that. It hadn't gone as well as he planned. Um, and he wasn't sure whether to come here, or to come to Oxford, actually, and do his master's, or to go back. So there was a lot of... Um, tussling in his mind. He felt lost. He felt he'd made the wrong choice. You know, uh, uh, he really found this big uh, transition, if you like, very, very difficult because he had been, everything had been so plain sailing for him. So he went to the doctors, January the 6th, and presented, uh, you know, he spoke about um, feeling depressed and anxious for the first time. And the doctor said, well, perhaps it's your thyroid. There was nothing in his notes to say that he'd ever had a problem with his mental health. So perhaps your low mood was because of your thyroid. So he came back in, saw a nurse, had his blood test, blood taken. And it turned out that, no, he didn't have a problem with his thyroid. So off he went. Um, the doctors are... Uh, to, they should ask, often they don't, but they don't have much mental health training, we know that, I'll come on to some of the work I'm doing, but um, certainly they did ask in this case, have you thoughts or, or, or have you any feelings of um, suicidal thoughts, have you any suicidal thoughts, and at that point he said yes, fleet it, you know, some, some, but we know that one in 20 people have thoughts of suicide at any one time. That's the figure that the Samaritans give us. So we know that. So it's not uncommon. So, and yet we never actually share that very often, do we? We don't actually uh, hear that figure spoken about much. Um, he was also asked, have you any plans? So those are the two um, questions that doctors should say, should ask. And at that stage, he didn't. So he was sort of sent on his way and, you know, if he gets, uh, you know, you can always come back. Well, he did, he rang back, but by this time, uh, it was another doctor and he spoke to that doctor on the phone. And the doctor said, well, I'll prescribe you some citalopram, an antidepressant, come and pick it up at the in-house pharmacy. Well, he did that and four days later, he took his own life. So we feel very strongly that there was a correlation between those first few days of taking that antidepressant and um, him, his increased anxiety. We feel he was overwhelmed, literally overwhelmed. He took his own life at home and um, we feel it was a, a mad impulse, really. There was no note left. We had no indication. Of course, it wasn't something that was in the family. It's not something that we had really talked about. We knew he was struggling. It was the first time, really, that we'd got a sense of that. But our minds didn't jump to suicide. And I guess it, it's been great hearing from um, Fraser and James because um, of, of being so open and honest, because I think we now need to actually really be aware that this isn't uh, a small problem with a minority of people. As, as you've heard, it's 6,500 deaths um, by suicide. And in fact, the numbers have increased dramatically, which is devastating. Working in suicide prevention, as I do now, I used to be a teacher, I was a lobbyist, um, I've worked in theatre and I was originally a journalist, so all the communications, if you like, and I'm passionate about communicating. So when you hear that the figures have gone up by 12%, um, the biggest rise since 2013, and people are talking about the, this more, there is, um, we do need to, to keep up the momentum of talking, and there's a Perhaps um, it's a complex set of, um, it's a complex picture why that has gone up, but certainly we know that young people in particular. So, but I'm not here to, to give you a doom and gloom. I'm trying to actually, if anything, um, sort of encourage how amazing it is that we can all talk about this now. This is what we need to be doing. So it's brilliant to see you, and it's brilliant to see the men in the room because 
I now work um, for the NHS as a consultant on suicide prevention. As part of my work is to try and change the NICE guidelines as well, uh, because I think it's wrong that someone can be prescribed a, a, an antidepressant for the first time over the phone, but there is no NICE guideline to say that you can't. So I'm working with people like uh, Lewis Appleby and Nav Kapoor, uh, leading, um, uh, leading academics, if you like, in in suicide prevention. I feel that's wrong. Um, and, and Ollie's Future is doing a, a campaign about that. But um, it's interesting as well that, um, you know, we, we've come together. So Ollie's Future is, is Oliver's future. It is his future. So he lives on in the work we do. Uh, it's wonderful that I think we're quite unique in a way. I mean, I, I'm, the only, I'm the old one, and all the trustees are young friends of Oliver's. So we are healing through the work we do. Um, we, we've got so many lovely people that, that will do different things to help us um, with our work. And we've trained about 822 people, I think, last count, um, in suicide prevention. I felt... Um, like Fraser was saying, uh, I, I wanted to know how on earth, what else could we have done? We, we supported our son as best we could, and, and so did his friends, but clearly we didn't ask the right questions. Um, and that's one of the, uh, the reasons I've sort of become a trainer in, in ASSIST. There's a, a two-day training, uh, speci especially about how to intervene. It's asking those questions. Um, and listening. I think Fraser said listening, that's so important. And knowing what to do, knowing how to respond. Because I, I feel very strongly that men, you know, as you say, they, they speak, they, they, you, you do speak. Um, but when someone says they're suicidal, the instinctive thing is to sort of shut down. It's horrible. You don't want to talk about it, especially if you don't know um, how to help someone. And the doctors themselves are, are not trained. They don't have the training in mental health. So one of the, uh, some of the work I'm doing is quite, uh, it's a pilot um, through the Sussex NHS Partnership Trust, but it is up to upskill GPs. And we've done surveys in 30 different GP practices. And I have spoken to GPs and said, look, you know, what do you need? And they're the first to admit, we don't have the knowledge, we don't know what to do. So it's, it's great that we're now looking at that because we know that, um, I think it's something like, yeah, two thirds of all people who take their own lives weren't being seen by a medical professional. So they weren't. And, I, and one of the things we need to bear in mind, I think, is if you're bereaved through suicide, you're 65% more likely, or you're at risk yourself of taking your own life. And I can speak from personal experience, because I don't have depression, I don't have anxiety, I'm one of these amazingly positive people, which was like, which exactly like Oliver. And we love life, great fun. Uh, I'm great fun, <laughs> you'll have to believe me about that one, but, um, but Oliver certainly was great fun. And I think certainly... Um, you know, the the idea that you could feel, uh, someone like me could become suicidal when we don't have some sort of mental health um, depression or, or anxiety or, or something that would be seen as a, a cause, um, it's hard to sort of get your head around. But actually, being bereaved through suicide can make you suicidal. And I felt suicidal because of the loss Simple as that. I don't, you know, it's as simple as that. And we're not aware of that. So workplaces, colleges, we need to be aware. And it's once we're um, talking about these things, we can help ourselves and we can help each other. So uh, what do we do in Ollie's future? We do all sorts of things because Oliver was such a fun-loving person. We have a big party every year. We have the love and light party. And our... Um, our motto, if you like, is love and light, because that's what needs to come out. I think, you know, we need to feel more love and, and channel sort of light. And that shone through in Oliver. 
And that's why I think we've had so much support because of the person he was. And we want to continue that. And that's, that's the best way of, of um, helping each other and being open. It's sort of like, you know, just, just to sort of connect with people human to human, not, you know, looking at their issues. Um, we do uh, campaigns, nice guidelines. We do things like the training sessions, pay for people to go on suicide prevention training because I do feel that's so important. And we have, um, I mean, we've got a, an award for Oliver, the UCL um, Oliver Hair Altruism Award, because when he died, everyone was, you know, he was such a compassionate, loving person. And I think that's the other thing. I think there's a lot of misconceptions. Um, I think Fraser spoke about, you know, uh, that feeling of um, people being better off without, without them. That's, I think, the mindset. It's not a selfish act. I certainly didn't think with Oliver, he was more concerned, I think, about... He would say to us, oh, I don't want to go on about this. I'm just dragging you down if I tell you about how I'm feeling. Um, so it, we've got to really rethink um, the whole idea about suicide. It's there. It is obviously something that is not uncommon, but we can prevent it in a lot of cases. And um, what else can I tell you? Well, I'm going to introduce you to Rory as well, because Rory knew Oliver from the age of 11. Um, I, I'm just going to, yeah, I think I've sort of gone through everything that I can do here. I don't, I, people have spoken for quite a long time, and, and they have touched on the things that I wanted to talk about. So, so I, I, we can only say so much about suicide prevention. Um, and, uh, yeah, just to say that, obviously, um, the figures are that the 45 to 49 age group is the highest. Actually, what people don't realise, and that's, this is in men, is also the older age group, um, sort of 75, 70 to 75 plus, is also a big age group for men who take their own lives. But then you also have the young young men under 25, and it has increased. So um, why? What, what, what are the reasons for that? Well, it would be interesting, actually, if that comes up in a, as a topic. Um, they have changed the standard of proof now. So it's now a civil standard. So it's, be, it's the balance of probability as opposed to the criminal standard of proof. Um, which was uh, beyond all reasonable doubt. But that hasn't actually, uh, that doesn't seem to be the, the reason for the, um, the rise in the figures. So it's, it would be interested to, interesting to hear what you feel. Um, what else can I say? I just say to you that Oliver um, was the essence of love and light. So I think it's wonderful that you're here tonight to listen. And I think it's great that the men are here because you are, um, you're the champions, really. You're the champions that can change, make the change. And we as women, uh, we're crucial in that dialogue too. So we need to work together um, with love and light and save lives. I'm going to turn, hand you over to Rory now. And, uh, thank you. Thanks, Anne. And you speak so well about this, I don't think there's that much left for me to say, so I'll be quick. Um, I mean, I knew Ollie for 12 years, so I wanted to share my perspective. Um, unlike Anne, um, I do get quite anxious, and I find things like this quite anxiety-inducing. My palms get quite sweaty, my heart races. I've got this new Garmin watch that's probably going to tell me I'm exercising too intensely at any moment. Um, but Ollie, I knew him from the age of 11 and we were close friends, really close friends from that time. We actually lived together. Uh, we went to a boarding school called Christ Hospital um, and um, yeah, we, we shared rooms. Um, we came close. in that kind of environment. It really is like a sort of family scenario. You know, you, you really get to know one another extremely intimately 
Um, and Ollie was always just the kind of most loving, funny, amazing person to be around. As Anne touched on, he was incredibly popular, incredibly smart, uh, incredibly high achieving, uh, and that continued beyond our time at CH where he went on to UCL uh, and I was also studying in London so uh, we, we kept in touch and we remained, uh, we remained very close but it was in that, that time after uni where as Anne mentioned Ollie had gone to Shanghai uh, to work for the British Council out there as an English language assistant uh, and that's when uh, things began to change and things took, you know, a turn for the worse, especially when he, when he came back after about six months for, for Christmas. And, you know, all through knowing Ollie, he, was, he, he didn't show signs of, of depression or ill mental health. It, it was only really in this, this period where it kind of, it, it came as a surprise and, you know, he, it wasn't like he didn't talk, he did talk about it and he, he did go to the, the GP and as Anne mentioned, you know, that uh, there was a lot wrong with, with how that was dealt with, but there were also, you know, signs that we didn't really pick up on or pick up on to the extent that, you know, that we appreciated their seriousness at the time. Um, and part of what we do at Ollie's Future now is, is train people in assist training, which is an accredited uh, award, award or accredited training um, that teaches you kind of the signs um, and how to work with someone that is showing signs of being suicidal. Um, and yeah, I just think that is that is crucially important because having been through it, you can pick up on those signs and know you know, you're trained in, in what to do. Uh, and so if anyone here is, is interested in, in that course, um, come and speak to us afterwards. Um, but yeah, as, as, as Anne has said already, like Ollie's shone so bright um, and that's what we're trying to continue in the work we're doing now. Uh, so we have two committees as part of Ollie's Future. We have the prevention committee that's all about changing policy, changing the NICE guidelines, um, and providing training. Um, and then we have the celebration committee as well, uh, which is all about putting on fundraising events. And our next one is on the 21st of March, so please do come along. Uh, it's on our Facebook page. Uh, it's in Elephant West in West London. So it'll be a great night of celebrating Ollie's life, but also fundraising uh, for the work we do. Uh, so if you have any questions about Ollie's future, just come up to us afterwards or ask questions uh, following the talks. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, both uh, Rory and Anne. That was really moving, really inspiring talk. Um, last but not least, we have John Manning, um, who's going to talk to us again about something I'm sure very different. But we'll see. Thanks. I'm a walker. <laughs> yeah. Well. Hello. You all all right? So, been quite impactful so far, hasn't it? Can everybody stand up, please? Don't worry, don't be shy. It's Cambridge, we're not that serious. Can everyone just close their eyes and just take a massive deep breath, please? In and out. Whenever you're ready, take a seat. Thanks. Did you guys do it as well? Yep. Oh, good, good. Um, so my name's John. Hello. I, a couple of years ago, started a company um, called Arthur Ellis Mental Health Support. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. I'm going to tell you a bit about my story as well. A little bit impactful, like everybody else's. Um, so I hope that everyone can listen to it as it being my story. It does not necessarily have to be yours. But today's all about men, manly men. And I 
did reach out as a guy. I did seek help. Then I began to decide against it. And there's a particular reason why. Then we're going to have a look a little bit later on in a couple of practical things that you can do if you start experiencing mental health issues, in particular related to anxiety. I'm quite objective. And in relation to providing stats, um, providing different pieces of awareness, I don't think in the long term that that's going to necessarily help an awful lot of people. I think that there fundamentally needs to be a change across the country about how we deal with mental health, not necessarily just individually, but how we deal with other people's mental health as well. And there's things within schools, there's things within politics as well, I think we've mentioned, that I may touch on later, um, depending on how frustrated I get with the whole situation. So, <clears throat> Between the ages of five and six, I was sexually abused at school. Um, throughout my fifth year on, in the world, uh, I needed to have uh, two corrective surgeries. And as a result of the, the trauma related to what I was going through, um, I then developed uh, an, an abscess on my neck through stress, essentially, which then also needed to be removed. So I was three surgeries within my first year of school. By the time I was six, I was put into a children's mental health clinic. And I don't remember a lot of it. Very beige, uh, extremely beige. Two-way mirror as well. Um, and I don't really get what happened. Um, the funny thing about trauma is, I don't know if a lot of people know about trauma, but if it's not dealt with at the time, or very close to the period of time that it happens, it can come back and it can be triggered in sort of 9 to 13 years' time. I don't know if anyone knew that. So when I was 16, something triggered. I don't really know what it was. It may have been because when you're 16, you start becoming sexual and all of this sort of stuff. So maybe something triggered. And I lost my childhood memory. It's something called blocking or locking in psychology. Um, GCSE time, brilliant. So, 16 was the, the first attempt in my life. I was at a house party, because no one starts drinking at 18. It's a lie. So I was at a house party, 16, everyone had gone to bed, and I was at my friend's house and decided to raid the cupboards for pills, and there was a half bottle of Sambuca left, sat in the kitchen, and had the lot. Didn't work, woke up the next day, horrendous, feeling absolutely horrendous, covered in sick. But at that point I went to the GP. I went to the GP and I, you're absolutely right, GPs aren't trained in mental health. I was told to go do a urine test, came out of the toilet and the Wikipedia page for depression was open. Didn't fill me with an awful lot of confidence, but I was put on some medication, told to go home. <clears throat> uh, but this was after my mum was called. I thought, I can have a bank account. Mum doesn't need to know. I don't have to tell my mum that this has all happened. But ages 18, your mum gets phoned. So mum turns up and we went for a reservoir walk uh, to try and calm down a little bit. And if anyone goes onto our website, Arthur Ellis, you'll see there's conkers in the branding and we went to pick up conkers and that's why they're there. I was able to uh, go and see a psychologist at that time. I was referred. Uh, it didn't take very long to actually see them. But the psychologist, I was sort of 16, nearly 17, sat in a in Tyndall in Aylesbury. Uh, I don't know if anyone's from Aylesbury. Don't go. Um, but I was sat in Tyndall. It's now flats, but at the time, it's a mental health hospital. So I went there and I was waiting in the reception and the, the psychologist I had an appointment with was 40 minutes late. <clears throat> Went down, we only had 20 minutes left, so I gave them a very brief overview. They asked me a percentage of how bad I was. It's like 100. So I had an appointment a couple of weeks later. Things were starting to improve. I was, my mood was a little bit better. And uh, the second appointment, I was asked, um, you know, what's your percentage? Sort of like 80. I'm like, great, discharged. You're better. So I didn't really feel encouraged to talk about my mental health at that point. 
and 18 comes and I was looking at universities, I was traveling down to London and there's also this other phenomenon uh, where you go into like a vogue state or a, I don't know if it's if that's the correct term but anyone seen Breaking Bad? Yeah, hands up if you've seen Breaking Bad. Not that many people, great. So basically um, you kind of lose track of where you are, you forget what you're doing and I was on the train down to London to have a look at this uni and completely forgot what I was doing. I don't know why I was there. I just spaced out completely. And as soon as I arrived, I don't know actually how long I was there for, but my mum ended up phoning um, later on in the day to ask me how the uni was. And I just sat above railway tracks the whole day. So I went back to Tyndall. I was actually put in for a couple of weeks at that point. And um, there was no history, uh, there was no kind of assessment. I was just put in and um, for a, a period of weeks drawing, you know, shading pears and um, drawing kettles and, and just things that would occupy me and try to distract me from what was going on, not actually tackling it. And I think this is where my objectivity comes from now. Um, because trying to listen to whale song in a room, you know, full of other people when you're 18 years old and you've got A-levels going on and you're trying to do different things, it's very, very difficult. It's not normal. It's not something that we should really be accustomed to. There's got to be another way of doing this. So I stopped reaching out and I stopped talking about things because nothing was really helping. I didn't feel like I was getting the support despite me talking about it, despite me trying to, to speak to professionals about it. But by the time I was 24... I had been an alcoholic for a couple of years, uh, kind of escalated with alcoholism, start having one drink and then you have like 10 and turns to 20. So I was having a litre of gin a week, um, four bottles of wine and because lemonade wasn't a good enough mixer anymore, I decided to mix it with Copperberg. So it was just r ridiculous. And my liver was packing in at this point, around 24, 25. So I went to my GP, reached out, and I got an appointment um, at the local NHS services. I was diagnosed with an addictive personality, um, which was fine, but they didn't treat that. So I went away. More started to happen. And I went back and I was diagnosed with something called uh, social anxiety disorder. A different department that dealt with it. So I got re-referred and a year later I saw somebody. They had a different opinion, so I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. A different uh, unit, so I got re-referred. A year later, um, well, a year later that referral kicked in. But in the meantime I got a little bit frustrated. Luckily at the time I had quite a good job. Um, and I was able to go to the Priory, if anyone's ever heard of the Priory. Uh, it's basically where famous people go to get treatment because it's £400 an hour. Yes. So I had one appointment and that was all I could have. And I was diagnosed, um, sat down with the doctor for an hour, incredible doctor, Dr Neil Brenner, psychiatrist, and he said, oh, you know, tell me about what's happened, tell me about your life. And he said, you've got bipolar, type 1. I was like, what? What's that? What do you do? What, you know, what does that mean? And um, he described it to me. It made a huge amount of sense. It was a massive weight lifted off my shoulders because I could understand not only what my behaviours were for the last 21 years, but someone was actually engaging and talking to me about what was going on quite practically. So he wrote uh, an angry letter about... You know, not necessarily angry, not angry, but he was encouraging me to get onto a very urgent list for some support. And it took a year for that to then kick in. So I saw a nurse a year, a year later. In that time, I jumped in front of a car. Because um, a year is a long time. It's a very long time. And what else I did, because the car thing didn't work, was I went to look at a load of mental health training. I thought, I'll go train myself. I'll go figure out you know, what I can practically do myself 
what I might be able to speak to about my partner, how I might communicate with my boss, my family, about what's going on. And everything was geared around signposting, go to your GP, um, self-refer to the mental health services. I wanted to avoid my GP at this point. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want to go see them. They wouldn't want to see me. Um, so I decided to get my worst nightmare in a room together. So put an advert out, calling all psychologists and psychotherapists. So I managed to get a group of us together, or them together, and I wanted to try and understand from them how we might be able to develop some training that doesn't necessarily just signpost people, but it trains people in simple self-help psychological techniques that we can begin to build into how we live as a culture, how we can operate so that if someone does say they're experiencing something or they're not quite sure how they feel, naturally as humans we have tools that can help them. We have strategies that we can talk through a friend or a co-worker in order for them to recover, manage or cope with what's going on. I then was able to access my own psychology. Um, sat down with a nurse, she opened my file, and she was like, oh my God, do you want to see a psychologist? Like, yes, yes, please, I would like to know what's going on. It's been 21 years. So I saw a psychologist and I had to see two doctors uh, for an hour each for about nine months. And the stuff that I learned was really quite simple. And it was stuff that you were given as homework, so you didn't have to actually sit one-on-one -on -one with a clinician or anything like that. I was just like, why doesn't everyone know this stuff? Why don't we just naturally know what to do? Why aren't we taught in school these little techniques or these little strategies that you can use that can support feelings of depression, that can get you out of that rut, that can support feelings of anxiety so that it remains an emotion rather than developing into an illness or a condition? Why aren't we taught this stuff? And yes, reach out. Yes, go see your doctor. But understand that it, recovery is a long period of time. It takes a while. With these real simple strategies, I haven't had a really bad relapse for a long time, a couple of years. I don't take medication anymore for my bipolar. And as a result, we've been able to develop training that we're going in to teach kids at schools, teach businesses. So we build a little, call it recovery team, just because it's quite cute. But we, we call it a recovery team and we teach people within businesses, or we're, we're at the minute we're looking at teaching a group of year 10s who are mental health ambassadors in their school and they wear a badge. But if someone goes and speaks to them, they don't have any practical stuff that they can actually give to a student. So we're going to teach, look at the school, look what issues are present, and we're going to actually teach these children the different self-help strategies that they can talk through with their peers. So they can start doing something about it. They can start actively supporting someone to recover, to manage, to cope, or to just maintain their mental health. And as a result of this, we are a company that provides these services. Ultimately, we charge for them, but the profits that we do, we go to running a, a free children's one-to-one -one service. There's about 110,000 kids last year that were denied treatment because the NHS is too full. They just get rejected. You're not bad enough. You can't come in. That does my head in. So by providing training, by providing one-to-ones to adults, by providing products, we have bracelets that Ed Sheeran's mum makes. She's lovely. I don't know him. We're not related. <laughs> Before you ask. But setting up a variety of different business revenue streams, we're able to actually do something good with it. We're able to create a culture that's focused on recovery rather than just sitting and dwelling. I didn't reach out because I knew no one would help me. I knew that I wouldn't be able to access some help. It's very different now. People are getting more wise to being able to help. But we need to build this into our culture as a country. 
We need to know what to do to actually be able to help somebody. And yes, there's a huge amount of issues in the country which I kind of want to solve them all because I get a little bit carried away. But looking at the future and where we want to go, it completely depends on what sort of country we want to be. And I want to be in a country where if I do have an issue, someone can talk me through strategy, someone can objectively, practically help me. That's the kind of place I want to live in. And yes, we can throw money at the services. It depends on how they spend it, ultimately, where they, get, where they actually put that money. And we can have a look at solving knife crime and solving different things by throwing money at the police. But if it's reached the police, it's way too late. We need to get proper behavioural change in schools in order to stem these issues before they start and before it gets to that point. So, one of the things that we teach is around anxiety, overthinking stuff. Anxiety is a lot about future uh, situations. We start worrying, you start thinking. Has anyone ever thought before? Your hand up. Oh, good. Okay, so, I don't know if that would have been rubbish, you know. Um, so, there's a really simple, easy tool that you can do to stem your overthinking. And it's called 527. Um, really, really simple, low, low effort strategy. And all it is, is we've got any endurance athletes? No. So, if you do endurance sports or anything like that, you will notice that as you breathe more and as you uh, exert yourself, you will naturally breathe out more than you breathe in. That's because as humans, on occasion, we're smart. We have a reserve of oxygen in the bottom of our lungs, which is for jumping out of the way of tigers and back when we were cavemen and women. Um, protecting ourselves. So we'd have like a little bit of reserve there just so we can jump out of the way of stuff. And the thing is with that, we don't really need that now. We don't use it a lot. There's not a lot of stuff to jump out of the way of, thankfully. So that gets really stale and it gets really rubbish and it's just not very good for anyone. So one way in which we can support our minds, especially if we get into a rut of overthinking, is by readjusting that and refreshing the oxygen that's going around our body, our brains, so that if there is anything that we're thinking about, we can address it slightly differently and a bit more, a bit more productively with a fresh brain. So I'm going to fresh your brains, if that's okay. So if everyone can get their feet flat on the floor, nice and comfy in your seats, hands on your lap or in the air or wherever. And if you can close your eyes if you're comfortable to, now what we're going to do, when I tell you, is take a deep breath in for five seconds, hold it for two, and then breathe out for seven. So, do I have to start right now, if anyone started? But in for five, out, uh, hold for two, and out for seven. And I want you to do it for three rounds, and then open your eyes. And count those breaths in your head as you go. So start whenever you're ready. I did say open your eyes whenever you're ready. And you do a couple. So everyone relaxed. They're quite nice. Quite big breaths. They're quite tricky sometimes. But did everyone count as well as they went? Yeah? What weren't you doing when you were counting? Hmm? Thinking, yes. So if you're getting stuck in a anxiety-inducing thought that you can't quite get out of that situation that's in the future, 
you can just do a couple of seconds of that and it just breaks that cycle. It's something that's really, really simple, really easy to do. You can do it when you're driving. Don't close your eyes if you're driving. Oh, that's close. Don't do any of that, but you can do it anywhere. And it's just a really simple thing to just distract your mind and take it off of whatever situation you're looking at. There are loads of these different tools. So if you are going to reach out, and I encourage you to, I encourage you to speak to anyone, but have a look at different things that you can actively do in the meantime. Set up a positive plan moving forward. Because recovery is a bit of a journey. It takes a long time until you're on top of things and back in control. But you will get there. It's just a case of putting that effort in yourself and looking at the different things that you can do that are positive. And we've said about things that may drop off um, in terms of practice or training and little characteristic changes that you might see in friends. Think about what those things are that you do that keep you well, that keep you healthy. For mine, it's exercise, go to the gym, sleep, and talking to my family. They're the things that drop off when I start to get unwell. I know now, and I can control. Priority for me is exercise. If I keep that in check, everything else is fine. My lowest priority is speaking to my family. Just being honest. <laughs> they know that, I think. This is recorded, isn't it? Yeah, they know it now. So <clears throat> but I know that I can go for a, a week or so without speaking to them. They don't panic too much because they know that's my rhythm. But if I can keep my exercise there and I can keep that consistent, I know everything else is going to fall into place. So whether it's consciously or subconsciously, think about the things that keep you well. And if you start to notice characteristic changes in yourself or a friend, help them map out what those things are for them and put a routine around it and a structure around it and help them through it. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Um, so yeah, I'm personally just overwhelmed by um, just the diversity and the, the quality of, of all the speakers. Um, so yeah, really happy to have you guys here. Um, so we're going to open it up in the last 20 minutes just to the audience. So if there are any people with questions, um, just feel free to raise your hand. We'll get a microphone out to you and then we'll just pass the mic and hopefully maybe relatively briefly if everyone can just give like a short answer of their, their views, just because we're running short on time now. Um, so yeah, if anyone's got any questions in relation to anything anyone said or anything in relation to the topic of the world of masculinity in mental health in, and in our society. So we have a gentleman over here. Firstly, thank you everyone. I'm hugely privileged to hear the, the testimonies of so many survivors. I mean, I think it's amazing hearing this. Um, I'm struck by a common theme from many of the speakers about the failures within the health system uh, you know, down to lack of knowledge, down to lack of coping strategies, the extreme amounts of time that people are having to wait for referrals, um, the lack of basic empathy, all these kinds of things which to me seem like fixable problems. Um, what do you feel is the way to get these fixed? I mean, obviously funding, but I mean, what, yeah, what, what is the way to get these fixed? Well, um I've been asked to work with um, Health Education England, so I've been asked to be the sort of co-producer of a new culture change. They want to um, bring about a culture change in primary care, and it's called Practice Hope. And the way forward that we're looking at is to work with the whole of the practice. So it's not just the GPs, it's receptionists, it's all the staff, nurses, anyone that's connected with... Um, the, the, the project I'm uh, solely re or responsible for is the 10 to 25 year old age group because they realize that, I mean, um, suicide, suicide statistics start at the age of 10, would you believe? Um, before that, they can't definitely say if it's suicidal or not, but they have started at 10. So it's 10 to 25-year-olds, and we're working with the GP practices. 30 of them now have signed up, which is, it's been such hard work to get the practices signed up. Um, I, I came on board as the patient's care lead with a clinical um, lead as well, a psychologist, and we were naively thinking that loads of practices would sign up but they haven't 
gradually we've got them on board. And if it's successful, I've spoken to the suicide minister about this. Uh, who knows who the suicide minister will be when we get the uh, result. But um, they're aware of the project. We're hoping that it will give good results and that it will then be rolled out nationally. But it's a step in the right direction. And it's been because of involving um, people, young people, children, young people who are suicidal or self-harming. We are relating it with self-harm. 50% of um, people who've died through suicide um, have self-harmed. They've had a history of self-harm. So we are linking suicide and self-harm. Okay, yeah. Take it, yeah. So um, everything you said, I completely relate to and understand. I think that um, I also do similar work. So the NHS is quite keen to get people with lived experience to um, help shape policies. Um, sometimes that's a more sincere effort than other times when you're just there to tick a box. But I think that the problems are fixable. Um, but there's a huge issue of resource. There's a huge issue of staffing. There's an issue that we write policies that we can't get put through because Brexit. Um, so we need to get Brexit done, scrapped. Um, but I think that there is, there's, it, it just has to be um, sophisticated as well because, and, and take account of the whole picture because, for example, with eating disorders, we developed a waiting time standard and for children and young people. Now children and young people are being seen within eight weeks but what happens when they are seen is it good is it useful you know I um, waited over six years to be seen at all by a specialist for eating disorders and more recently in Cambridge tried to access the service and it was the third time round that I got that I got accepted onto the waiting list and then I was really really happy that I finally did um, and I thought, and I was filled with hope that it might be useful. And, I, and then when I got there and I found it really unhelpful, you know, a basic lack of compassion, a uh, lack of understanding of other issues that aren't specific to just that one niche of eating disorder. So I think there are loads of issues. There's morale, there's resource. Like As soon as I could, I started getting involved volunteering with the service that I was with when I was, when I was younger. And seeing it from the other side, I, I realised... You know, as a patient, I was really disappointed with how little they could provide. And then working with them, I was like amazed they could do anything. I was I was so surprised that they could see everything because there were three members of staff for a quarter of Wales for all adults with eating disorders. You know, and it's it's very little more now. Um, so many years later, so I think that one thing that I would really like to see is people being honest about that because when you're a patient, you expect some kind of help, and it's like the service will help you to recover or something and will give you the time and care that you need. And they're not honest that they can't. And it would actually really help, would have helped me to have heard, you know, it's not because you're not ill enough and that it's not, a, that it's not important. It's because we do not have the money and the time to see you. I would have really appreciated that because I wouldn't have taken it as it's my fault and I'm therefore stigmatized by it. And even yet, I don't get the help that I need, but I know that it's not, it's not a reflection of me and they can just be honest about it. So I think we're a long way from having enough resources, enough staff, enough expertise to help everybody. And if, you're, if they're not honest about that, I think that people pay the price for it personally. So you just have to recognise that it's, it's, it's not okay as it is and not to be on the defensive because that really, really hurts people who are struggling, I think. Uh, in the interest of hearing lots of other questions, I'll keep it brief, which isn't my forte. Um, I take everyone's point about the understaffing, the under-resourcing, the terrible experiences that people often have with the NHS. I think that the reason that maybe where I come from, uh, the angle that we take with Movember, rather than the angle that's being taken here, and every angle is important, we need to push all of them, is that uh, ask yourself, where does your GP come from? Where does your therapist come from? If we're growing up and we're developing and we're training in an environment that isn't conducive to supporting people with mental health better, then no matter how much training, money, resources, it's not an us versus them. It's not a there's us and there's GPs. GPs are people who grew up wanting to help people. They're people who dedicated years of their lives uh, to then be shuttled into a system that makes it very difficult for them. And I think that if at a grassroots level we've listened to people talk about how it takes them, you know, it could be anywhere between eight weeks to a year before you see someone, 
you're likely to bump into an office colleague or a mate on a daily basis. And I think that it starts from that level and we build up and the priorities of government, the priorities of a health system will change over time as the people who are running it have different priorities. And that comes from their culture and the way that they talk about mental health. So I think that to wheel a bit back to your question, you know, what can we do? I think that as people who aren't GPs, there might be some people here who are, I'm certainly not. Um, talk and get people talking and trying to talk in an effective way which is what a lot of people have said you know you can talk and say nothing um because gradually one of those people that uh is in this room will either end up in the medical profession or have a friend who does and that's how those changes come about it's not necessarily top down it's often from the bottom up thanks hi what was your name sorry martin, martin. I, I think that it's a case from my perspective, that everything has now become a numbers game. You are trying to get your stats down and the good stats up. And um, we tweeted something. Um, we, we tweeted that it's a national statistic that 75% of kids don't get into CAMs that are referred. Well, my phone goes off and it's Children and Mental Health Commissioner. The reason they called was because they wanted to address the stat that we'd put out there, saying that it's a national statistic, not their specific local statistic. And I said, why is your local statistic different? It's because they offer pre-assessments. So it's more, instead of 75%, it's more like 13%. It's like, great. So you offer a pre-assessment. What do you actually do for the child, though? You, have, you give them one appointment and then discharge them. So they don't actually get any meaningful support. You're just doing it to get your numbers down. And I think that with whatever job we do, whether it's in the NHS, who is fantastic, I love the NHS to bits, and I don't want it to go anywhere. But at the same time, I think it's in every single different profession. We've probably all done things or cut corners in order to make the score or the stat that we need to make good, good. Because it's not necessarily the easier choice, but because everything else in society that we've got to do, it kind of makes sense. We're a relatively smart majority of the time, humans, so we will cut corners if it still gives us that result. And I think that that's happening more and more, not necessarily just in the NHS all over. So we need to recognise when we're maybe doing that and stop it, because ultimately it's getting to a point where people are dying as a result now. And I think that's part and parcel of the issue, if that answers your question. Cheers, Martin. Just, um, just a brief point. I've, I've been reading the diary, Adam Kay's book, uh, The Diary of a Junior Doctor, This Is Going to Hurt, which is equally funny as it is tragic in parts. And one of the bits that struck me recently was as a kind of story that comes up throughout the book, which is... I mean, he, he speaks very candidly about his experience in the NHS and it makes you fall in love with the NHS as well as highlight, uh, you know, become more and more aware of its flaws. And he describes one night being, um, being up at 2 a.m. on a night shift and he goes on Facebook and he sees, uh, like I think, the brother of a friend post something like, I'm ready to, to end this. Um, and being 2 a.m., he thinks you know, holy shit, I'm probably the, the only person seeing this. And so he responds saying, you know, here's my, here's my number, give me, a, give me a ring. And the guy does call, but he says, you know, very candidly, like, he wasn't trained in this. He didn't feel any better equipped than the next guy to respond. And they continue to have these conversations throughout the book. And, um, and they're positive, but I just, that really struck me and, really resonated given given the work we're trying to do to to to, to train um gps through press, practice hope and are there any other questions so open it up yeah go with them don't, don't think the microphone's working i mean you probably hear me um i suppose i suppose one of the really important things that all of you have highlighted is that um it's important to be aware, it's important for men to be aware of mental health issues. Um, but one thing that's also been implicitly highlighted is that each of you 
each of you started really looking into mental health once you had a personal experience with it in some form. So how do we best go about getting men and other people to start thinking about mental health before it becomes an issue for them or one of their peers? <laughs> Sorry, what was the... the how, do how, how do we get people to get involved before they have a personal experience? Well, I think sadly, a lot of people do have a personal experience to start off. Um, I mean, given that suicide is the biggest killer of men in, in the UK for, for the age range that Fraser hi highlighted, a lot of people have been affected um, and even more people have been affected you know, by depression or anxiety or at least knowing someone. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult issue and, you know, even having been personally affected, I still find it very hard to grapple with every day, you know, with my personal experience, trying to come to terms with how such a thing happened, you know, to, to the particular person that I, I knew. Um, so yeah, I think... I think it probably does have to stem somewhat from from personal experiences, but it shouldn't have to take a personal experience to trigger action and awareness. And so through the work that great organizations like, you know, Movember and Papyrus and Calm and that Ollie's Future are doing, I think that is paving the way for for change. You know, we've seen the Minister for Suicide Prevention being been appointed and it feels like this is being taken more seriously now but there's a lot more to do and and hopefully people come to appreciate that yeah um so i think i, I had an experience quite recently of going to the home office and doing a bit of a talk about eating disorders and there was part of their day on mental health awareness and they were having uh, slideshow and the first thing was like what is mental health and then they had to talk about it as a group and everyone was saying like um, depression anxiety bipolar disorder all this kind of stuff and I just had to like stop them and be like the question is what is mental health not is what are mental illnesses you know and like what does mental health good mental health look like so you said we don't ask that question and we don't we don't educate ourselves about it very much whereas we do about physical health so systemically like education is a big issue um, I just did my master's in the education faculty and it was kind of related to that. Um, so I think I wouldn't really agree with being in this debating chamber. I don't agree with the premise of the question because <laughs> <laughs> I think you said all of our comments came out of our personal experiences. Well, we all have experience of mental health. Like this idea that just ill mental health is... Um, something that, you know, some people have experienced. We all have mental health. We all experience varying degrees of mental health every every day or whatever. So, like, the, the fact that some people have experience of mental health and others don't, I just don't agree with it. And, like, well, what does, what does the good mental health look like? What do people have to do in order to stay well like they do with their five a day and that kind of stuff? So, sort of turning that a little bit on its head. Is there anyone here from the North... Right, <laughs> so, so, Birmingham. I think when you say how do we get men to talk about mental health, you've got to recognise that we're sat in a room of incredibly, one way or another, no matter how you got here, privileged people, privileged because we're here. If you map suicides, you can map them against two things. You map them against socioeconomic development and you map them against geographies and you'll find they're disproportionately in poor socio-economically developed areas in the north. Um, and I think that what we've got to think about is in terms of getting men to talk about things is that it's one thing taking mental health and saying men deal with it differently to women. You can't put all men in one bucket. And I'm going to find it easier to talk about it from one point of view. My family, for example, we are very open about things. Um, everyone's got something. Mine's depression. If you're a family, and I know families like this who I've worked with through Movember, who I've met by going and doing advocacy at rugby league matches, for example. Um, if 
you're fourth in line of doing the same job as your dad and it's not a blokey thing to talk about feelings because you've got far too much else to get on with, that's a very different angle that you need to approach it with. So I think that if we want to get men talking about mental health, you've got to think about how do you target it in different areas. No two blokes are going to think about it the same way. Within Cambridge, I would say that people are probably better educated and have more of an awareness of mental health than you're likely to pretty much anywhere else. Um other than other universities where it's also talked about. I think that you've got to think about who you're talking to, what kind of a man you're talking to, what's their past. Because we all have experiences, but they're all drastically different. And I don't think many of us could even imagine the kind of experiences that I had somewhere north of Birmingham. Not because I don't like north of Birmingham. I love it. Um, but because it's a different history. It's a different lifestyle. And it's a different kind of man. And there are different kinds of men across the world. That's why Movember is a global organisation. We started in Sydney, for crying out loud. Um, so the way to get men talking about mental health is looking at what kind of man that is and how do you reach them? Uh, we do it through capital letters and manly branding. Um, but you know, there are lots of different ways of doing that. Um, I, I think from an individual perspective, I think you would find it very, very difficult to force someone to reach out. Um, but I think that we, we really need to start being honest with ourselves about when we are experiencing stuff because often you might just brush under the carpet um, think that it'll get better in a couple of days or a week or so um, and ignore it. But I think that if we accept that on occasion, maybe more often than not, in some respects, we're going to have a real shit time. Like that's life. We, you know, sometimes we have rubbish days, sometimes we have good days. But it's knowing about what to do in the shittiest parts of your life um, and how to engage with it and recover from it that's important. And I don't think that we're taught or encouraged to to learn that stuff enough uh, and recognise when we are having a rubbish moment and knowing what to do about it. But I think that, yeah, from an individual perspective, we just need to be honest with how we actually are because often we don't really register that or know. Perfect, thank you guys. Um, are there any other questions as we're, as we're wrapping it up? Any at all? If not, I actually have, I have a personal question. Um, so someone actually told me today that as we grow up, we are given a set of rules, and that's by our environment, by our parents. And we kind of keep those set of rules as we grow up. And I think growing up, especially, doesn't matter how you grow up, no matter your background, it could be different gender, different ethnicity, different sexuality, anything. But I guess focusing on the topic of today, growing up as a man, what kind of rules do you grow up with that you think are kind of toxic or kind of preventing good mental health? Um, as we are running out of time, time maybe just in a few words. Um, for you guys. Come back to me because I don't remember growing up. <laughs> um, oh, goodness. It's very difficult, isn't it, as mothers? Um, you know, that was my role in bringing up my two sons. And um, this whole nature, nurture, I think life has changed. Um, there is so much uncertainty now, I think. So the rules are sort of out the window. Um, and, I, I, you know, and historically family unit has changed completely we're in a and with climate change i don't know if anyone heard the announcement today about the levels of carbon dioxide in the um the levels the concentration of levels in the atmosphere i mean goodness me it almost feels like there are no rules anymore so perhaps perhaps because i'm so positive this is a chance for us to forget the rules and recreate our own now um, you know, let's, let's, we know what needs to be done. We know we need to talk. We know we need to, uh, bring up our children equally, um, not imposing, um, sort of emotional rituals on girls and boys. Certainly when I grew up, you know, girls were able to cry and, and help in the kitchen and boys weren't. I mean, I don't think anyone would perhaps come from that background nowadays, but, I think we have a chance now to create our own rules and make sure that we listen and 
we share and we love as well. We give love. I think that's all we can do. Just really, and know that from your heart. You know, really, really feel that. And it's not a mind thing. It's actually feeling love for your fellow man. You know, you're the person that you, you see in the street, the person you're sitting next to, um, the person that serves you in the shop. Just try to feel from your heart that you care about them on a human to human level. It doesn't matter what mental health issue they have, whatever spectrum of mental health, just connect with them as a human being. And those are all the rules you need. So sorry, I don't know. Let's get rid of the toxic ones. Let's, get, let's create our new ones. <laughs> um, difficult question. I think I inherited a lot of toxic rules, but they're mostly from my mother when I think about it. Um, like not taking up space, not being able to ask for help, having to serve everyone else and not look after yourself. Um, so I'm, I'm struggling to think about ones that are specifically to do with being a man. But then I, I think when I grew up... Um, thinking about being a bit older, things around um, body image and around prescriptive rules about how you ought to look. And I think it's particularly toxic in the um, gay community where it's absolutely acceptable to put yourself into a box depending on how you look and to reject other people depending on what um, label they have about how they look. And we don't challenge that with each other. Or if you do, then you're not cool. Um, I think that we face a lot of pressures on, on our bodies as women have had to cope with for so much longer and we we don't have the feminist movement we don't have a body positive movement um, that's really more mainstream and we could learn a lot from the feminist movement in terms of how to support each other and reject um, pressures and narratives that say you have to look in a certain way I think you know it's, it's a bit of a uh, maybe it's a bit of a niche thing for me as someone with an eating disorder and with sort of experience of body dysmorphia but I think it's a pressure that we all face it's one of these examples of things that we just don't talk about. So I think we could do more in that area. I'm sure Movember has a rule that they wish I'd thought of, but uh, I'm just going to go with gut feeling here. Um, not so much a rule, but something that was always implicit being at an all-boys school, and I think that's where my, certainly, issues with self-esteem began, is, um, is, is don't take it so seriously. It's just a bit of banter. I love banter. I'm terrible at it. I have terrible jokes. I'm just like my dad. Um, but I think that as a blokey bloke, you're not necessarily conditioned, but the implicit understanding is that if I take the mickey out of you, you can take the mickey out of me. We can all take the mickey out of each other and no one should take it personally. Someone at some point is always going to feel something and be like, oh, that hurt. But because of this contract, this, this nonverbal contract we've got, you can't say, no, I'm sorry, that was off. And... That was certainly the core of a lot of the things that I struggle with. Um, feeling like you have to give as good as you get. When often I didn't want to give. I didn't want to give flack to someone. I wanted to make sure they were all right. And I desperately wanted someone to make sure I was all right. Um, so I think this is, works for all ages, whether you're an older person who's maybe got influence over kids or a younger person who's still in that environment. I think that knowing where the line is between having a bit of a banter and actually hurting someone's feelings and them not wanting to say anything because of the uh, the sacred covenant of banter. Um, just come up with that trademark. I think that's quite important. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It's a hard one. Um, yeah, I think to keep it brief, I, I suppose it's like just being okay with feeling uncomfortable. Maybe it's that's in it in yourself, but also the kind of uncomfortableness of asking someone how they are as well. I think that's how my grandma has this expression where she's Scottish and she say things are all very tickety boo, <laughs> and that's kind of like that was the thing to aim for, you know, tickety boo ness. I don't know if it comes on a spectrum, <laughs> but um, you know, aiming for things are just they're okay. You know, um, let's. Let, let's hope that it stays on that that nice you know that nice plane of tickety bonus. Um, but life isn't like that. And <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I could say anything as succinctly as you, but the rules um, should definitely change in in that regard. So um, Arthur and Ellis, uh, what our company's called, Arthur Ellis Mental Health Support. They were my granddads. Uh, Ellis, um, Northern, 
uh, tiny little place in Yorkshire called Kinsley. And um, again, another one not to go to. Um, but he had something called schizoaffective disorder, um, which is a bunch of horrendous words put together. But it means uh, that you essentially have symptoms of schizophrenia and bipolar combined at the same time. No one understood, no one knew what to do. He was in hospital for 36 years. So I, I don't remember a lot about childhood, um, as I mentioned, so I, I don't really know what I learned early on, but when we found out that Ellis existed and had died, um, my mum was extremely distraught. She didn't know that he got out of hospital. She you know, really wanted to reach out, but it was too late. So she went into quite a deep clinical depression for, for a period of time. My dad turned around, and from a young age, it was like, right, John or Jonathan, uh, you're washing up, Heather, sister, you're doing the washing, we're going to alternate dinners, we're going to help mum out. So I learned this way of being supportive and figuring things out and creating solutions while family was going through this time. So when I was having the rough patch when I was 16... Um, I went to a friend, Guy, we went round and sat to his house and told him just after I'd got back from the doctors um, and gone to put, do conquer picking with my mum uh, that I'd you know, started on this medication. They told me I was depressed. And he replied with, I've got the new GTA. Do you want to put it on? So I think that in, in terms of a long-winded way to get back to toxicity um, is to ensure that who you reach out to and the people that in your life uh, that you're going to keep in your life are going to help you. Don't keep the people in your life that aren't going to be helpful for you. Um, it will be a hindrance and it will probably have quite a bad impact on you in the long run. It's difficult to do. It's difficult to let certain people go. But if you are going to begin to reach out, uh, or if you are going to talk to somebody, ensure that it's the right people and you've got the right people around you. More importantly, that you get the ones that aren't helpful for you away from you as quickly as possible. Thanks a lot, guys. So... Um We've come to the end after two hours. Like, thanks for guys for sticking around. Um, <laughs> surprised you've gone this long. Um, but yeah, I've, I'm personally this is a past all spec all expectations. Um, I'm really really grateful for all the speakers. Um, yeah, they've definitely impacted me. I'm I'm sure many of us in the audience. Um, and yeah, thank you guys just for coming because it is a really important issue, and it's nice to see that there are so many people that are involved with and up for kind of changing their perspectives or learning a bit more.